I'm Gary Schaefer, Director of Glendale Library Arts and Culture. On behalf of all the public libraries in Los Angeles, Ventura counties, and beyond, thank you for joining the Southern California Library Cooperative and my library for this event, which is part of our series, Be the Change, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism. Be the Change events build collective understanding of systemic racism elevate the story, the voices and stories of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and inspire our communities to be the change. The series is generously supported by the City of Glendale Arts and Culture Commission, Outlook Newspapers, and Niche Academy, which is graciously hosting us on their platform. You'll find more Be the Change events and information at glac.info slash be the change. We are currently featuring the online exhibit, Reckoning, Racism and Resistance in Glendale in our library's Reflect Space virtual gallery. In 2020, Glendale became the first city in California and only the third in the nation to adopt a sundown town resolution. Sundown towns kept African-Americans and other people of color from living in certain communities through formal and informal methods in a purposeful effort to maintain a white population. The resolution acknowledges and apologizes for Glendale's racist past and pledges to work towards an anti-racist future. We are hopeful other cities in Southern California and beyond might one day considering taking similar action. Our virtual exhibit, Reckoning, Racism and Resistance in Glendale, through six weekly episodes, presents the racist and sometimes violent history of the city, Glendale, alongside the grassroots resistance mounted by civil rights activists and everyday citizens. Please check out episode one at our Be The Change website. Tonight, in honor of Black History Month, we are pleased to be hosting Richard Rothstein in conversation with Susan D. Anderson. Richard is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a fellow of the Thorogood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and of the Haas Institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, Richard spent years documenting the evidence that governments at all levels not only ignored discriminatory practices in housing, but often promoted them. You can order a signed copy of his book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America from Once, a Time, Once Upon a Time Bookstore in Montrose, California, using the link on our Be the Change website. Interviewing, uh, Dr. Rothstein will be Susan D. Anderson, history curator and program manager at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. Ms. Anderson is a member of the editorial board of the California History Journal. She has published and lectured widely with an emphasis on California's hidden African American past. Susan's book, Nostalgia for a Trumpet, Poems of Memory and History, was published by Northwestern University Press. Her forthcoming book, African Americans and the California Dream, is currently under contract. We encourage you to email questions throughout the talk for the, this dynamic duo to libraryinfo at glendalca.gov. And now I'll turn the virtual mic over to Richard and Susan. Well, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate being here and uh, very happy to be joining in conversation with Richard Rothstein about his important book, uh, Color of Law, that examines the, uh, how the federal government in the US, how state government and local governments deliberately segregated cities and neighborhoods. Um, I want to refer to the introduction that Gary just made because this program is part of a series that grew out of, as he explained, a resolution by the Glendale City uh, uh, Council to uh, acknowledge and apologize for its racist past and looking at its, its efforts as a city um, to, to remain a whites only city and certainly to prevent uh, African Americans from not only residing in the city, but from visiting the city beyond sundown. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Um, and, and you could help us understand, was Glendale um, 
was was Glendale unique in this sundown town practices? Uh, did Glendale's approach to systemic racism resemble that in other communities? No, there was nothing unique about it. This is a national story. We have a national myth that we tell ourselves. We all do it, um, whites, blacks, liberals, conservatives. We say that what we have in this country is de facto segregation, something that just happened in fact and not in law. And that's a paralyzing myth because if it was just something that happened by accident, something that just happened naturally, it's easy to believe that it can only unhappen naturally, unhappen by accident. When we understand that uh, not only was Glendale not unique, but federal, state, and local governments were all mobilized with racially explicit policies, nothing um, subtle about them, racially explicit policies to ensure that Africans and whites, whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of the country, creating a, a white noose of federally created all white suburbs, from which African Americans were excluded. Uh, this was a national pattern. Uh, I know, uh, you know, I've, I do a lot of the speaking. Um, I used to go around, travel around the country speaking about this, and since the pandemic, I'm just doing it on uh, online. But every place I go tells me that their their places, uh, their city is just so unique, and it's uh, segregation is worse in their community than it is anywhere else. And um, I I congratulate you all on believing that but you're part of a national story. And that's important also to know because it's going to require national solutions. I will say one thing about Glendale that this, I've been provided with this information that um, it was singularly successful in its attempts um, to, to remain a whites only town and to prevent African-American residents. When you compare it to surrounding towns, Glendale, has 1.8% of its population as African American and you know compared to Los Angeles, Long Beach, Lancaster it's uh real it's it it had unfortunate uh, uh unfortunate results and and uh, unfortunate uh success let's uh talk again about the the premise of your book um what you're saying in the book and in, in the extraordinarily researched um, work that you've done documenting uh, the efforts of, of various levels of government, but especially through the lens of the practices of the federal government uh, and showing the power of the state and the power of the government in segregating uh, communities. Um, what what drew you to examine uh, this as a as a practice and to see what many other people do not see? Well, I was an education policy writer up until about ten years ago, a little bit more, when I started to look into this topic. In the 1990s and 2000s, uh, I was writing many many articles criticizing the dominant education theory of this country. That theory was that we had an achievement gap between black and white children. Black children achieved at lower levels than white children on average. And we had a national story. We told ourselves that the reason that there was an achievement gap was because teachers were bigoted. They had low expectations. They just didn't try very hard to teach African-American children. And this was such a widespread view that we enacted it into law, the No Child Left Behind Law of 2001. And the law said that we would test children every year and predicted that if we test children every year and hold teachers and schools accountable for their test scores, the achievement gap will disappear in seven years. I thought it was a ludicrous theory. Um, I wrote column after column about it. Um, it was a ludicrous theory because it's true, certainly. There are some teachers who are bigoted. Some teachers have low expectations of uh, black children, but that's not the reason we have an achievement gap. The reason we have an achievement gap is because so many African-American children come to school with serious social and economic challenges that impede their ability to take advantage of even the highest expectations in schools. And so I remember, um, I'll give this illustration, I remember writing a column once about asthma. 
as you may know, uh, African-American children in urban neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children in suburban neighborhoods. It's an enormous difference, four times the rate. African-American children in urban neighborhoods have such a high rate of asthma because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more trucks driving through, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment. And I wrote that if you have um, asthma, you're more likely, not necessarily in every case, but more likely in a child without asthma to be up at night wheezing and then come to school drowsy the next day. And if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, same racial breakdown, uh, same uh, social and economic background, same family structure, but one group has a higher rate of asthma, that group is going to have lower average achievement simply because it's sleepier on average than the, the group that uh, doesn't have asthma. And it's not that asthma is a big cause of the achievement gap. It's a trivial cause, but then you begin to add up all of the other social and economic conditions that affect achievement uh, of children in school. Asthma, lead poisoning, African-American children have much higher rates of lead poisoning than white children, and lead poisoning has a measurable impact on IQ. Uh, homelessness, economic insecurity, by the time you've added all these things up, you've pretty much explained the achievement gap. Well, I was thinking about this, and um, I began to realize it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. What happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these challenges? How can such a school ever be expected to have the same average achievement as a school where children come healthy and well-rested um, from economically secure homes? Uh, you can't have that expectation. You can enact the law, as we did, the No Child Left Behind Act, with that expectation, but it's a... Uh, of course, it didn't accomplish anything that it promised. The only thing the No Child Left Behind Act did was it gave schools a teaching of low-income children an incentive to abandon a well-rounded curriculum so they could spend all their time trying to raise test scores by drilling children in math and reading. Um, well, we call schools where we concentrate children with all of those disadvantages. We call them segregated schools. And schools today are more segregated than they have, have been at any time in the last 45 years in this country, more segregated. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I still wasn't thinking much about housing, but I began to think that maybe neighborhood segregation was a school problem. And then in 2007, well, I'll just finish by telling you this story. In 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision that evaluated two school districts Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of them had a very trivial school desegregation program. They gave parents the choice of which school a child would attend, but if the choice was going to exacerbate segregation, it wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who didn't. So if you had a school that was all white and mostly white, both a black and a white child, um, a child applied for that last remaining place, the black child would be given some preference, a trivial program. Uh, you don't have very many situations where you have one place left in the school and both a black and a white child apply for it. But the Supreme Court evaluated it, denounced it. Uh, the uh, controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He said it's true the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. He said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. A pretty wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. Uh, and then he went on to say that the schools in uh, Louisville and Seattle are in segregated neighborhoods because the neighborhoods were segregated and the term he used was de facto, just by accident, because of private bigotry of homeowners or landlords who wouldn't sell or rent to African-Americans or businesses in the private economy like banks and realtors and developers, or maybe people just liking to live with each other of the same race, or, or maybe, um, uh, uh, because of income differences. These are all the things that cause segregation. Government had nothing to do with it, he said. And if you have de facto segregation, it's not a civil rights violation. Uh, no violation, a uh, uh, civil rights violation requires government action. Uh, and if you have de facto segregation, government is prohibited from doing anything explicit to address it. Well, I read this Supreme Court decision and I remembered and this is how I got involved in the research and writing that led to the book, The Color of Law. I remembered reading about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky. In Louisville, 
There was a suburb called Shively. There was an African-American um, not living in, in that suburb, living in the center city. But there was a white homeowner in this all white suburb of Shively who was a friend of the African-American. The African-American was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child. Nobody would sell him a single family home. So the white homeowner in this all white suburb of Shively bought a second home in his community and um, resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob of white neighbors surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop any of this activity. They protected it, in fact. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence. The white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to an African-American family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the courts are all mobilized to enforce racial boundaries in Louisville. I began to look into it further. I found there were hundreds and hundreds of cases. I document many of them in the, uh, the book, The Color of Law, of police protected, sometimes police led and organized, uh, mob violence to drive African-Americans out of their, the homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in previously all white neighborhoods. One of them I described in, the, in my book took place in Eagle Rock, not far from you um, uh, in Glendale, but they were all over the country, hundreds and hundreds of these cases. Every one of these was a civil rights violation, a violation of the 14th Amendment because the police are state actors as are the courts and the prosecutors. And um, I began to look into it even a bit further and I found that it wasn't just state-sponsored violence that created the segregation that we know today, but there were many, many federal, state, and local explicit racial policies designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another. So that's how, that's how I got to this. It was by accident. It was because I was an education policy writer and I came to understand that uh, the problems the schools were facing were a reflection of neighborhood segregation. That, that segregated residential patterns led to segregated schools. And, and what the book provides is a really kind of devastating history of these practices. And it gives people a sense of also uh, many of the tools and strategies that were used by government as well as private industry in league together. Uh, so what I'd like to do is begin talking uh, a little bit about that history. And let's talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, evidence and the stories that you reveal about public housing. Um, well, many of us today have a picture of public housing, uh, and but have very little sense of, of how it emerged. Um, and I'm especially interested in what you write about uh, World War II, and the post-World War II era, when there was such a severe shortage of housing, when you had a population boom, baby boomers were being born, uh, veterans were returning home, the Great Migration was underway, and the housing shortage was severe, and the government began uh, became a housing developer, began constructing housing. But it's from the beginning, from the inception, had these rules regarding um, racial segregation? Well, uh, Susan, I can't be brief. There are a lot of questions there. So let me uh, take them in parts. Public housing is what you began with. Uh, there was no public housing in this country before the New Deal, before the Depression, before the Roosevelt administration. Uh, we think of public housing, as you suggested, as a place where poor people live. Uh, lots of single mothers with children, lots of young men without jobs in the formal economy. That's not how public housing began. When the first public housing was built in this country in the New Deal, it was not for poor people. Poor people weren't permitted into public housing. Uh, public housing was for working class families. Uh, you had to have a good job, a stable work history. You had to be able to full cost, pay the full cost of the housing and your rent. It wasn't subsidized. Uh, the first public housing in this country was created uh, by the Public Works Administration, one of the first New Deal agencies. It um, took place at a time when we had many integrated neighborhoods in downtown areas in this country. 
Uh, we'd be stunned if we were transported back to that period to see the extent of integration that existed. Not everywhere, of course, but in downtown areas, it was a commonplace because we were a manufacturing economy and factories had to be located in the deep water ports and railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products. So you have the factory district uh, that employed both black and white workers, uh, not just in the factories, but in the banks that serviced them and, and every other institution that surrounded those factories. They had to live in broadly the same neighborhoods. Uh, they had to be able to walk to work or maybe take short streetcar rides. That's what the mid 20th century, early 20th century was like. Well, the Public Works Administration went into many of these neighborhoods and segregated them, creating public housing projects that were segregated, separate projects for whites, separate projects for African-Americans, creating segregation frequently where it hadn't previously existed. Um, the great African-American poet, novelist, playwright, Langston Hughes, wrote in his autobiography that he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. Said in high school, his best friend was Polish. Said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. Well, it was an integrated high school, an integrated neighborhood, not surprising. The Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood, demolished some housing, and built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans. And with other projects also segregated elsewhere in Cleveland, um, created a, and perpetuated a pattern of segregation in Cleveland that we know today. And this went on all over the country in, in, um, in my book, The Color of Law, where I can, I like to describe self-satisfied smug places that think they're better than others. Uh, one I talk about, uh, maybe you've heard of it, is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, the area between Harvard and MIT, the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. But the Public Works Administration and other federal agencies went into that neighborhood, demolished housing, and built separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans, creating a pattern of segregation that exists in the Boston metropolitan area with that and other projects uh, still today. Okay, you asked about um, World War II. <clears throat> and this is particularly uh, apropos of the West Coast, of places like Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle and Portland. Hundreds of thousands of workers, black and white, flocked to centers of war production during World War II to take jobs that hadn't existed during the Depression. <clears throat> Uh, in California, elsewhere in the West Coast, uh, there was shipbuilding, there was uh, airplane manufacture, tanks, jeeps. Um, if the government wanted uh, those war products to be produced, they had to find housing for these hundreds of thousands of workers who were flocking to California uh, uh, in order to take these jobs, and it did. It created segregated housing everywhere. Uh, workers working in the same war plants, but having to live separately, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. And I say that because there were very few African-Americans on the West Coast. There were some, obviously, a very few African-Americans on the West Coast prior to the great migration uh, to California and elsewhere um, to take these jobs in the war plants. So there weren't existing segregated patterns, segregated patterns in San Francisco, for example, uh, uh, the federal government built uh, five projects for shipyard workers primarily, four for whites only, one for African-Americans placed in a community that later became the black neighborhood of San Francisco, the Fillmore District. In Los Angeles, the government needed housing for workers in um, Santa Monica who were working at the Douglas Aircraft Plant. It's now the Santa Monica Airport. It placed that housing in Watts, which hadn't previously been a black neighborhood, but it became a black neighborhood because that's where the government placed housing for black war workers during World War II. And the same policy was followed in um, uh, uh, Seattle and Portland, and, uh, up and down the West Coast. That's how the West Coast came to be segregated, was World War II housing policies of the federal government. Okay, the, you asked the, about, I'm sorry, go on. Well, I was just gonna move be a little bit beyond World War II. Um, and because there are so many um, strategies, so many tools and so many policies. And I wanna cover a couple of things before we end up opening it up to the people that are in the audience. Um, another issue, and uh, I do wanna mention California that we're familiar with, I think, is the suburbanization of America 
you write about the way that government and the real estate industry created a culture of home ownership, of really whites only home ownership, um, and the and the creation of whites only suburbs, which is a huge feature, uh, uh, particularly uh, of Southern California. I know that it happened around the country that was part of a national pattern, but you, de you do mention suburban neighborhoods like Lakewood and Westchester and Panorama City here in Southern California that people are gonna be familiar with. And I think many of them will be surprised to find out that they were created as whites only uh, suburban uh, neighborhoods um, and with the explicit policy to keep out African-American homeowners uh, and, and residents in these enclaves. And so I would love for you to please talk a little bit um, about uh, how these uh, whites only enclaves were financed um, and talk a little bit about that, the dynamic of how they were created. Sure, you know, I used to live in Los Angeles for about, uh, I don't know, about 20 years or so. And I remember going to the Mark Taper Forum for theater uh, in downtown Los Angeles, and I did this research. I learned that Mark Taper was a builder. He became wealthy by creating uh, Lakewood uh, near Long Beach um, uh, for workers primarily at the McDonnell Douglas plant uh, there in the, uh, uh, near, near Lakewood. Um, a developer like Mark Taper or Henry J. Kaiser, who built Westchester, uh, could never have um, assembled the capital on their own to build these giant developments. They were 15,000 homes. No bank would be crazy enough uh, to lend them the money to build these homes. We weren't a suburban country at that time. I'm talking about the immediate post-World War II period. As you mentioned before, millions of returning war veterans coming home, needing housing, uh, had enormous housing shortage. Uh, the, the banks, thought this was a crazy idea. We were in a suburban country. Who's gonna to wanna to move to these places? Uh, the only way that Mark Taper or Henry J. Kaiser or on the East Coast, uh, William Levitt, perhaps the most famous developer there, <clears throat> the only way they could build these giant suburbs was by going to the Federal Housing and Veterans Administration, submitting their plans for the project, the materials they were going to use, the architectural design of the homes, the layout of the streets, and, excuse me, <clears throat> a federally required commitment <clears throat> never to sell a home to an African-American. The Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration even required these developers to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. This was not the action of rogue bureaucrats working on the FHA or VA. It was written in federal policy manuals called the underwriting manuals that were distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the application of builders for federally guaranteed loans to build a suburban communities, not all as large as the ones I've been talking about so far, small and large. The manual, said you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a developer's proposal if the developer was going to sell to African Americans. You couldn't even, according to the manual, recommend for a federal bank guarantee a developer who's going to build an all white project if it was going to be located near where African Americans were living, because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. I was struck by this. Uh, I, I have a picture in my book, The Color of Law, of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall. In Detroit. A builder in Detroit was required by the FHA to construct, to block off his proposed development from a nearby African-American neighborhood as a condition of his getting these bank loans. I read that and um, like I said, I, I said to myself, this notion of de facto segregation is utter nonsense. There's no basis in reality to it whatsoever. And that does not mean 
that there wasn't lots of private cooperation with it. You know, a builder like uh, Levitt, I have many quotes from him, um, uh, wouldn't have sold to African Americans if left to ho his own devices. He was a bigot, but he wasn't left to his own devices. He couldn't have built that project without a federal government guarantee. And if the federal government had told him, we're gonna guarantee your bank loans, provided you sell homes in your development on a non-discriminatory basis, he would have had to do so. And we wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have the segregation that we know in this country today. Well, it's extraordinary and that I remember the image that's in your book very well, because um, I think there are people who would look at that image and not know it was in the United States. It um, is a visual expression of a term like apartheid, um, literally the, 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 the literal separation um, of people by a concrete by a concrete wall in a Detroit, in a Detroit neighborhood. It's, it's very uh, uh, dramatic. Let's, let's move to another one of these um, uh, uh, functions uh, that was very widespread that people may have heard about uh, that we call racially restrictive housing covenants. Well, I mentioned that before, the federal government required these builders to place a clause in the deed of homes prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. They're still there today in California. It's attachment. It's an attachment to the deed called uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. And um, many of your viewers- CCNRs. Uh, yeah. CCNRs, yeah. <laughs> you live in a home in California that was built mid 20th century or slightly earlier than that. Look at your CCNRs. You may be shocked to see that you're living in a home that's for Caucasians only. Um, it's no longer enforceable, uh, but it, even uh, after um, enforcement ceased, it was a powerful symbol and warning uh, to um, African Americans about uh, them not being wanted in the community. And uh, this was also the case uh, throughout the country. These clauses were placed in deeds everywhere. You can't change it. You know, there are movements in various places to attach another document on top of it, to repudiate it, but you can't change your CCNR or your deed as you know, any more than you can wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, I'm going to change my property line. What's in the, what's in the deed is in the deed, and uh, it's there forever. Yeah, and it shows how history uh, is present. History is in the present. Mm -hmm. um, that we're not talking about something that is in some distant past that has little impact. Let's, in, in all of the work that you've done, um, what are your thoughts about the impact of, of these policies and practices and the impact of this history today? Well, they determine the racial inequality that we have today, even though the policies are no longer being practiced. Their effects endure and uh, remedies are required. You know, those homes that I mentioned before, the suburban homes that we were talking about in places like Lakewood or Westchester or Panorama City or Levittown, um, those homes uh, were sold initially for about $10,000, a little bit less. In today's inflation adjusted money, that's about $100,000. As you know, those homes no longer sell for $100,000. You can't buy a suburban home in any community in this country, in any city, city uh, for $100,000. The white families, uh, returning war veterans, but others as well, who were subsidized by the federal government to move out of urban areas into these homes, gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the appreciation and the value of their homes, from the equity that they gain from owning these homes. They use their wealth to send their children to college. They use it to perhaps take care of temporary emergencies like unemployment. They use it to subsidize their retirements and they use it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited, prohibited by explicit federal policy from participating in this wealth generating program. The result is that today, uh, 
on average, African-American family incomes are about 60%, 60% of white family incomes. You'd think that if there was a 60% income ratio, there'd be a 60% wealth ratio as well. People can save the same amount of money from the same incomes. But in reality, uh, while the African-American family incomes are about 60% on average of white family incomes, African-American household wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy practiced in the mid 20th century that has never been remedied and that determines to a large extent the racial inequality that we have today. I mentioned earlier uh, the achievement gap that results from the concentration of African-Americans in less adequately resourced neighborhoods and less healthy neighborhoods. Um, that uh, African-Americans are concentrated in those neighborhoods because they don't have the resources to move to better neighborhoods and they don't have the resources to move to better neighborhoods because unlike white families, they um, didn't get the wealth from the appreciation in homes that they were subsidized by the federal government to purchase. Uh, that wealth gap uh, determines today's health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because they live in more polluted, more dangerous neighborhoods. It predicts uh, the wealth gap that we created, our government on our behalf created, uh, predicts the, um, uh, the mass incarceration of Af young African-American men, police abuse of them that we spent so much time demonstrating about in Black Lives Matter demonstrations last summer and spring. Um, I'm not suggesting that police would never abuse African-Americans if it weren't for their concentration uh, in low-income neighborhoods, but it's much more intense because of that. When you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men without access to good jobs, without access to the transportation to get to those jobs, without access to schools that aren't overwhelmed by the social and economic problems of their, of their students, it's inevitable that the police are going to assume the stance of an occupying force. Much as police forces occupy um, in colonial times um, oppressed populations in India or the Congo, or it's the same procedures. We have a restive, um, suppressed population that uh, police are charged with the responsibility for controlling. And the wealth gap that we created with these unconstitutional policies also uh, is responsible for something else. A very dangerous, very frightening, and that's the enormous political polarization we have in this country today. I'm not uh, suggesting that it's entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines. We all know that. How can we ever expect uh, to develop the common national identity uh, that President Biden called for uh, in his inaugural address? If so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to understand each other, no ability to empathize with each other, no ability to know each other's life experiences. So those are the consequences, the ongoing consequences of the unconstitutional policies that we followed. I'd like to um, ask a question about how this situation has been contested uh, historically. And now before we talk a little bit about uh, uh, the government's role and you, men and you mentioned remedies, but um, I read uh, the transcript of a talk that you gave last year at UC Berkeley, and you mentioned that uh, you often get invited to speak during Black History Month. And we're ag again here in Black History Month, and, which, and we at the California African American Museum are doing a lot of programs and other, and other uh, projects. Um, but what you said in that talk was that you what you laid out in your book isn't black history it's a history of racism it's it's white history and um what i would like to address uh is that um on the other side of the picture that you present uh about the um uh, uh, actions of the government uh, is a 
are it is also a narrative of the campaigns, the lawsuits, uh, the protests, the struggles against these practices, and I think that um, in here, therein is a part of of what is is the Black history uh, narrative. Certainly not um, limited uh, to African Americans. But I think that con that, that con the, the conflict, the fight against the situation is also something it would be good to know a little bit about. You mentioned in your book many of the lawsuits, for instance, um, that, that uh, 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 were brought. And maybe you could address that a little. Well, at this point, um, there's very little that litigation can do to challenge segregation. Uh, the, the way in which our legal system is constructed to have standing to challenge segregation, you've got to be personally injured. You can't uh, be suffering the consequence of prior generations of uh, personal injuries. So um, I don't think that litigation um, is a, a something to hope for to solve this. It's going to take a new civil rights movement. It's going to take citizen action. It's going to take um, people mobilizing to make it as uncomfortable to maintain patterns of se racial segregation as the civil rights movement of the 1960s made it uncomfortable to maintain segregated lunch counters and segregated buses and uh, segregated uh, employment workplaces. Um, the remedies are well known. You know, we know what to do. There's uh, uh, think tanks, uh, uh, journalists like me, uh, 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 policy experts. They all uh, know what uh, the policies to redress segregation are. What's missing is uh, political support. Um, I can give you some examples of what we should do if we had that political support. And I'm not suggesting that uh, civil rights lawyers will be put out of business. They'll have lots of work to do defending policies that we get enacted if we ever have the political support to do them. It just can't start with litigation. But I mentioned, and we've talked about these suburbs like Levittown, like uh, Lakewood, like uh, uh, Westchester and Panama. Like Glendale. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right, like Glendale. Um, uh, those suburbs, as I said, were um, affordable when they were constructed to African-Americans as well as to whites Working class families, anybody with a job in the post-war economy could have purchased a job, uh, a home for $100,000 with a long-term mortgage. Uh, in fact, uh, I mentioned before that public housing at the time was uh, for working class families, people who were paying the full cost of the rent. Uh, white workers who were subsidized to buy these homes could pay less than their monthly mon mortgage charges, monthly housing costs, than they had been paying for rent in public housing. That's how much of a subsidy this was. Well. How do we remedy this? Well, I'll give you an example. I don't know the, the, the data on uh, Lakewood, or, uh, but I do know of Levittown. Levittown in New York, home sold at the time for $100,000. They're now worth $300,000, dollars $500,000. As a result of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which said, in effect, OK, African-Americans, you now can move to uh, Lakewood or Panorama City or Westchester. Nobody's going to stop you. But of course, they're unaffordable to working class families of either race. So what would an affirmative action program in housing look like, a remedy for this unconstitutional policy of the federal government? Well, the federal government should be buying up homes in these suburbs at market rates when they come for sale, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, whatever they might be, and resell them to African-Americans at deeply discounted prices as a way of uh, remedying the uh, unconstitutional segregation that um, uh, we created. That's one. Now, there's no political support for something like that at this point. That's why we need a new civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually working with a group of national civil rights and, and fair housing leaders to create something called a new movement to redress racial segregation. Um, our goal is to uh, not to advocate policy. We know what the policies are but to create local committees that are going to um, attempt to take action to redress segregation. I can give you one example, if I may, and then I'll stop on this mm -hmm. topic. Uh, 
you know, I wrote an article. I, I can send you, and, and you know, I know you're going to do an email um, uh, to attendees, so I can put links to these in, in the uh, email. Uh, I did an article a few months ago about a community in California, in Northern California, called Hillsdale, that was created in um, the 1940s by the federal government with the, as an all white community, uh, homes sold for about $100,000. Uh, blacks could have afforded to move to them. Uh, only whites were permitted to do so. Uh, those homes now sell for a uh, million dollars. Well, it's California. We have the, right. the well, highest, real, highest yeah. real estate markets in the country. Well, in this, in this article, I identified the bank, the real estate agency, and the developer that created that community as a, a segregated white enclave. Well, though, that bank, that real estate agency, that developer still exists today. They should be pressed to create a voluntary reparations fund, you could call it, to remedy the harm that they themselves have done, short of enacting federal policies in the national level to take care of this. So there are many, many things that can be done, but it requires a new civil rights movement. Right. It, it's the political climate here. What you're what you're working toward is is to generate a political climate um, that encourages these kinds of actions. Right now, I just want to you know make it clear to people in our audience, and we'll be going in just a moment to some of their questions um, that you are saying that our government has an obligation to address this history and these practices. Am I right about that? Yes, yes. Um, but we're not going to fulfill that obligation without a different political environment. And that's not up to the government to create. That's up to local citizens to create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you have laid out uh, some of the steps that you think it would take. And as you said, the remedies are known. Uh, it's always a, there's a, it's always a matter of the possible is always a matter of the gap between um, what we know to do and what we're willing to do. Um, I was told that um, we would be able to get some questions from yes. people who are in our audience, and I think now might be a good time to invite them in. Yes, absolutely. Hi, my name is Nicole Pacini. I'm Assistant Director at Glendale Library Arts and Culture, and I'm manning the questions. Uh, you can use the uh, uh, Q&A question box uh, on your screen to send more. I've got a couple here. Uh, one that just came in was, uh, since we're talking about kind of solutions, I would ask what you think about policies similar to a vacancy tax on even shorter periods of time for such new establishments like but the behemoth luxury apartment developments in sub suburbs today as a potential strategy. A vacancy tax? Well, I, 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 I'm not going to take up time answering things I, I really haven't thought about. I don't really haven't thought about a vacancy tax as part of this. It could be. I just don't know. Okay. All right. Have you seen um, other, it sounds like you talked about Hillsdale a little bit. Are there other communities that are, or other organizations, like you mentioned, private organizations that are making those steps towards reparations? That's a question that's- Well, um, I wrote that article about Hillsdale. I could have written about any white community anywhere in the country. It's the same story everywhere. Um, if um, I, I said, I'll, um, I'll provide this information uh, to you uh, in a follow-up email that will go uh, uh, to attendees. Um, if anybody is interested in um, being notified when this new movement to redress racial segregation is launched, I can put you on a list to receive that notification. Um, uh, I don't know of the redressing segregation. Let me say redressing segregation has four distinct elements and all of them have to be done. One is improving the resources in existing low-income neighborhoods. That's expensive to do, but it must be done. Second is preventing displacement from those neighborhoods when the resources improve. We call it gentrification. 
we improve the quality of those neighborhoods and longtime residents, disproportionately African-American and Hispanic, are forced out because the community becomes unaffordable. And we know again what the, the policies are. It's things like rent control. It's things like limits on condominium conversions. It's um, inclusionary zoning uh, programs that not only require units set aside for low income families, but for moderate income families as well who can't afford to live in a, to buy market rate homes or, or rentals in, a, in hot markets like California. Third is opening up white communities uh, to diverse residences, uh, residents. And uh, let me say something that may make you, me unpopular with your audience, but um, apologizing for the past is one thing. Doing something to fix it is something entirely different. And uh, that's something that uh, I think that, if I may say so, I think people who apologize for the past, it's important that they do, I give them credit, but they shouldn't take too much credit unless they um, uh, follow that through with policies to diversify their communities. And fourth is stabilizing uh, desegregation where it exists, where there are many suburban areas which are flipping from white to black or in, in, in much of the country or in California, white to Hispanic. And um, white flight then follows and soon a segregated white community becomes a segregated black or Hispanic community. And we should be um, taking action to stabilize the desegregation so they become truly healthy, diverse communities. So those four areas are things that any um, the civil rights movement should be working on. And uh, if we do, we can make some progress. You know, one thing I'd like to add, and you do write about this in the book, is that it, it's not just it's not just a question. I don't want the audience to have the the sense that it's not just a question of a well-off white uh, uh, um, uh, uh, communities versus low-income African Americans, um, you know, racial uh, segregation and the policies were anti-Black. They were and are um, targeted at African Americans, period. And um, Richard, in your book, you you talk about how there were two goals of the of the of the government and and the private uh, industry. One was to keep low-income African-Americans away from middle-class uh, neighbor, white neighborhoods. And the other was to keep middle-class and well-off black people away from white neighborhoods. And so the depth of the segregation, the issue of segregation is something that we're, we're dealing with here. And it's not just a matter of uh, 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 whether you're poor or not. One of the things that happened in this country was actually the development of separate black suburban uh, areas and separate black housing developments, but that's that's another another conversation. Well, Susan, that's a very important point. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned it. Many people think that somehow black and poor are synonyms. The reality is, that a minority of African Americans are poor. Most are working class, most are middle class, and um, working and middle class African Americans live in less adequately resourced neighborhoods than whites with identical incomes live in. So um, it's not simply a question of um, uh, enabling the poor to live in healthier neighborhoods. But working and middle class uh, African Americans are also concentrated in segregated neighborhoods. They're not as poorly resourced as low income neighborhoods, but an African American uh, family uh, a household with an income is likely to live in a neighborhood with higher poverty rates, with less uh, adequate uh, schools, and uh, uh, no uh, uh, grocery stores selling fresh food than whites with similar incomes. I'm gonna pop in with another question here. First of all, I wanna say I have a number of people sending me 
emails, uh, uh, sending me chats with e their emails, wanting to to sign up for the um, the local committees that you're planning, uh, Mr. Rothstein. So we will um, include that information in a follow up email to everyone who's on this um, on this uh, who's registered tonight. If you've registered, we have your email, and we'll follow up. Um, a couple of uh, questions that have. Uh, a, come up a couple of times here include um, how has this been um, these kinds of restrictions impacted other people people of color communities of color um, other than than uh, black the black community you know before Richard answers I want to quote his book and there is an answer but I want to quote he's he he uh, very well states that there's no question that many groups uh, were unfavorably impacted um, by racist practices, but his book um, shows that um, African Americans were singled out, um, and that Paul, that whole that wholesale policies were built around singling out African Americans. And I think it's important to not forget that. Let me give you a California example that I think will illustrate the, the, um, the point. We talked before about uh, these uh, deed clauses, the CCNRs that um, prohibited, uh, well, that restricted uh, homes to Caucasians only. And the language fre frequently uh, excluded uh, not just African-Americans, but Hispanics as well. The point of the CCNRs is that if um, you know, it was always it was always a, a, to the advantage of a white homeowner, even if his home was restricted, to sell to an African American. If the white homeowner wanted to move, maybe had a larger family, maybe got a different job somewhere, it was always to the advantage of an African American of, of a white homeowner to sell to an African American because African Americans' housing supply was so short, so small that the simple question of supply and demand, they were willing to pay more for housing than whites were willing to pay. So it was to the advantage of white to sell. So there were, um, I mentioned before, the hundreds of cases where African-Americans had uh, bought homes like that, they were driven out by violence, but some weren't. And at that point, the CCNRs per, uh, permitted um, neighbors to sue, to have the African-American evicted from the home that uh, he or she had bought in violation of um, the CCNR. Well, courts in California took the position that, uh, yes, it's true that the, the CCNRs exclude both uh, Hispanics and African-Americans, but Hispanics are really Caucasians, so we're not going to evict them. And um, so this is a sort of half discrimination uh, they were um, uh, discriminated against, and, and there were much worse cases of discrimination against the uh, Hispanics in California uh, than the one I just mentioned. There was state action um, in California. The other thing I'd mention is that the policies that I've been describing to you um, uh, this evening were mostly implemented by a federal government uh, that was running a country that except for places like California and Texas and Colorado, African-Americans were the really only um, low-income minority group that federal policymakers were concerned with. Uh, until recent decades, there were very few Latino uh, migrants to elsewhere in the country, some, but very few. It's only in the last few years, last few decades, that uh, cities around the country have become diverse beyond uh, racially diverse between blacks and whites. So the policies were targeted primarily at African-Americans, but they certainly caught up others as well. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give one more question and then we'll we'll start closing up. Um, Glendale has a, a, a bit of a notorious reputation. Uh, of course, I think that, that probably uh, that holds, that's in our question. Uh, and many black people in the greater LA area will not move here. What are the first steps Glendale should take to po post resolution to change that and diversify its population? Well, I don't know much about Glendale specifically, but uh, uh, many suburbs I'll say like Glendale 
have zoning ordinances that uh, require um, most development, if not all, to be single family homes on large lot sizes throughout much of the community. Uh, those zoning ordinances need to be abolished so that the uh, townhouses, garden apartments can be constructed, uh, low level apartment buildings that blend in uh, perfectly well with residential neighborhoods um, that would enable a, a more diverse population to move there. Of course, there's also the subsidies that are required, the affirmative action programs that I was talking about. Uh, that's what I was really referring to when I said it's one thing to apologize, it's another thing to actually do something to remedy uh, the unconstitutional policies that were followed. So um, th those are two things that I would mention. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I wanna thank both of you for uh, this wonderful conversation. Thank you to all of our um, attendees. Uh, I have multiple questions asking about access to the recording of this event, and it will be available on our website, on our YouTube page, and we will email it all out to you. And I'll let Gary uh, close up the session. Um, well, thank you so much um, to Richard and Susan for sharing this illuminating conversation with us all. Um, I would like to invite all our attendees, as Nicole just did, to visit the Be The Change website to see all of our many upcoming virtual events celebrating Black History Month and episode one of the Reckoning exhibit. Uh, and more episodes will follow uh, weekly for six total. So we look forward to seeing everyone at our next um, event. We'll announce in March um, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Month and say goodnight uh, to both Richard and Susan. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Good night.